Hey everybody, welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Pentax Auto 110. Because this is an electronic camera, and because everything that we do requires batteries, the first thing I'm going to show you how to do is change the batteries. You want to open up the film back here. You want to pull ah, this battery holder out, and these are looking not that good. Yeah, those aren't good. This uses two A76 LR44, A76 batteries, S76, 357. They're all interchangeable terms for the same thing. And they go into this caddy right here. This caddy is very clever. If you'll notice that right now, the, the, the symbol means it lines up with how you put in the battery. So that larger, wider mushroom top corresponds with this part that has text on it. So if you notice the part that is on your left has the mushroom top up, if we flip this around, it's still the case. So as long as you put the batteries in correctly, it doesn't matter which way you put this into the camera, the terminals will be lined up correctly and the batteries will provide power to the camera. So what you do is you take this little carrier and you put the batteries, come on, put the batteries in. like that. So you have it loaded correctly if you can see the text on one and no text on the other. And the side that has no text also has these little uh, plastic overhangs on it there. That's how you know that you've got, it, uh, got the batteries put in correctly. There we go. We can see that now. Next, we're going to just put it into the camera any which way. This is correct. Or if I take it out and rotate it at 180 degrees, as long as you have the batteries incorrectly in this carrier, that's correct. It does not matter how that goes in. Batteries are in and you're ready to go. Next thing we're going to do is load film. Uh, I don't have any 110 film, so you're going to have to pretend with me that I do. When you get a 110 cartridge, you're just going to drop it into here, right? Part of it goes here, part of it goes here, and then there's this bridge along here. You can see a little gear in the bottom there. That's the, the film starts out on this side and then whenever you advance the film, there you can see the gear turning. That turns and that pulls the film over this way, advancing the film through the camera. So your, your film is run the opposite direction as 35 millimeter film. So once you get your film, you drop it in there, you close the film back, and then you just advance and advance and advance until you get to frame one and the camera doesn't let you advance again. So it's two strokes per frame. It's about uh, 10 or 12 strokes, give or take, to get to frame one once you have the, um, the film loaded into the camera. You'll go through your entire roll of film and then when you're done, you just open up the film back pop out the cassette and put a new one in and then send the cassette, the whole thing off to be um, developed at a film lab. So it's a pretty easy system, very user friendly. If uh, you do open up the back of the, the camera and your film falls out, you just put it back in and advance a couple frames and you lose one or two frames. It's not the end of the world. Same thing with the batteries. If you have to change them, you just leave while you have a film cassette in there. You just leave it in there and swap out the batteries and then it, I would advance a frame just to make sure that I don't take a, a picture over a frame that's been destroyed by some light reaching it. And that's, that's the film. There's nothing to rewind. It's just put it in, advance it, take it out. It's really easy to do. You'll know you have the film loaded correctly when you look through this window if you can read the type of the film in there. Also, I, I think if, it's, if you put it in upside down, the back of the camera won't close. Honestly, never tried that. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to change lenses. We're going to mount and unmount the lenses. To remove a lens that's on there, you simply grab this button and you lift it up toward the top of the camera and then rotate your lens counter or anti-clockwise to remove it. And then we're going to get our other lens. I'm going to put the, the rear lens cap on the 50 millimeter here and move it over to the side and grab our other lens and pop it on like this. And to mount the lens, all you do is you find your focusing index here, which is that little orange triangle. 
and then you line it up with the lens mounting index on the camera, drop it in, and then rotate your lens clockwise until it clicks into place. With modern cameras, the, uh, the idea of a, of a crop factor is pretty common. Less so back in the day with these. This lens is a 24 millimeter. It's, it's, I think it's the smallest lens in the system. It's a 24 millimeter f2.8 lens. Oops, that's how I can read it. You need to read it. There we go. And this was the standard lens. It, I think it's uh, roughly equivalent to a um, 48 millimeter lens in 35 millimeter terms. So it's, so basically the focal length of these lenses is about half of what the equivalent 35 millimeter lens would be. That said, the 18 millimeter lens definitely feels a whole lot wider than a 36 millimeter lens. So the camera had a number of different lenses. We have the tiny little 24 here, the fairly large 18. This is not the um, body cap 18, they call it. This is the F2.8 18. Um, the focus free 18 is the, the other one. And that's an incredibly uncommon lens. Um, very rare, and I, I don't know whether it's any good or not. Then we have the 15 right here, or the 50 rather. It's the one I've had on most of the video, this one and the last. And then we have what is quite honestly my favorite lens in the series. This is the 70 millimeter. It has a 49 millimeter filter thread, but it looks way smaller than that. I always think it's got a 46 for some reason. But this is the uh, 70 millimeter, which is about equivalent to a 150 millimeter lens, give or take, in 35 millimeter terms. It's super sharp. Um, it, it's way better than 110 film can really do justice to. And it also looks really cool, won't lie. I think it is a very pretty lens. We'll come back to these lenses a bit more in a few minutes and I'll show you some ways to do some fancy things with your camera to expand the system for fairly cheap. The next thing let's do is let's look through the viewfinder of our cameras. And what you can see here on the screen right now is a mock-up of what the viewfinder looks like. And it's pretty simple. It's a focusing screen with a split ring in the middle. And down on the bottom right, there's a black notch cut into the um, focusing screen. And that contains lights that light up a different color to let you know whether or not you can take the image. It's green or I think orange or red. I think there's, there's only the two colors. Green means that you can take a picture and you likely will not have camera shake, image shake, uh, so you have a faster shutter speed. And then red or the other color, whatever it is, means that your shutter speed is too slow and you will probably get image shake. Using the split prism, you can find a vertical line and then focus your lens to align that vertical line in the split prism and then you know everything on plane with that vertical line is going to be in focus. If you use the matte screen and look at it, at the matte screen at an area and focus, you can see how parts of your uh, frame pop in and out of focus as you rotate the lens. And that's really very simple. You just focus and take a picture and you have really no way to control whether or not the exposure is going to turn out or whether it's going to be fast enough to prevent shutter shake or not. And, uh, and that's that. So let's take everything we've learned and let's talk about how to take a picture. You cannot do double exposures with this camera. So um, we'll talk about how to take a picture and then I'll show you some ways to expand this system to make it a little bit more vers versatile than what it was originally. So you're standing behind your 110 and you're looking through the viewfinder. What you're gonna do is line up your frame, your, the image and frame it the way you want it to be. And then you're gonna to focus to where you have the subject you want in focus, properly focused. Take the picture, advance twice. You have to advance twice to rearm the shutter and advance the film. And that's that. That's how you take a picture with this camera. It is almost the simplest camera that you can take a picture with. So if you've seen enough of my videos, you'll know that I tend not to like program mode only cameras. I find them to be limiting and somewhat challenging creatively. That said, um, I don't feel the same way about the 110 system and I think it's because maybe I expect less from 110 images or because the field of view on these is so narrow that it's forced me to look at 
the world differently, especially when I use the 70, which is my favorite lens to use. Set that there for now. So I mentioned there are six lenses in the system. I don't have the 20 to 40 millimeter zoom lens, and I don't have the uh, 18 millimeter fixed focus lens. But I do have the 24, 18, 50, and 70. That's a good array. It's a, it's, uh, it's a good expanded system for anyone to use. But 150 is not all that great. This is about 150 millimeters in 35 millimeter terms. Is not all that great for wildlife photography. In fact, my only complaint about this system is that when I've tried to take pictures of the uh, red-tailed hawk that lives in my apartment complex, I cannot get close enough to it to have them turn out successfully. So because this is a 110 system, it has a very small negative, and because 110 does not record as well as these lenses can, this is the one camera system where I'm going to suggest doing this. This is an auxiliary telephoto lens. And I got, this has a 49 millimeter. Uh, if you want to make the 70 millimeter lens on your 110 about equivalent to a 300 millimeter lens in 35 millimeter terms, this is how you do it. You put a telephoto extender on the front, you get an even bigger slab of glass. It looks even more um, insane. And what, when you see a, a frame through this, there's a little bit of softness at the periphery. Um, but the center isn't, as, isn't affected as much. In 35 millimeter terms, you'd, you'd have softness all over the place with a little small area that's clear in the middle. That's why these auxiliary lenses aren't good for APS-C and they are not good for 35 millimeter. But for 110, where you have a tiny, tiny little negative, these are pretty good. So you can pop this onto the front of your 70 millimeter lens, and now you've got a fairly decent um, telephoto for some wildlife photography. It works, works reasonably well. I've been happy with, with the results from this, bearing in mind that I'm comparing it to 110 results. One other limiting thing about this system, however, is that 18 millimeters is the widest. But if this, oops, the 18 millimeter lens has a 30 millimeter filter ring, so if we get a 30 millimeter to 49 millimeter, it's a 30.5, 30, 30, 30 and one half millimeter uh, filter ring. So if we get a step up ring for 30 and one half millimeters to 49, oops, and then we grab our 49 millimeter to series seven adapter that we had to connect the telephoto extender to the 70 millimeter, now we grab the wide angle auxiliary lens out of the kit. And this lens is, I believe, a 0.45X. We end up with another pretty obnoxious uh, looking contraption here, but this turns the 18 millimeter into something that's about equivalent to a 12 millimeter in 110 terms, basically making this about a 20 to a 25 millimeter lens in 35 millimeter terms. You get the same edge softness, but this does make it substantially wider on the wide end. So you know, all told, to expand some of the usability of the system, I spent $8 on auxiliary lenses and $4 on step rings so that I could connect them to the lenses that I use in this system. And so they don't take up a whole lot of space and they give you a whole lot more flexibility with the lenses that you may already have in your possession. If you really wanted to also go with the 50 here, it uses a 37 and a half millimeter uh, filter and you can pop a 37 and a half millimeter to 49 millimeter step up ring on it. Pretend I, I did, I'm not dexterous enough to do that today. And then you can use either the wide or the telephoto on it, although it doesn't give you as much benefit as using the telephoto on the 70 or the wide on the 18. So that's a fairly 
easy way that's not super expensive to expand the usability of your 110 system. Another way to hack to, uh, your 110 system to make it a little bit more functional, to, to, give you, to give you more control over it, is with this guy right here, which is a variable ND filter. And so basically the way that this works is that as you rotate the variable ND filter, it gets, your scene gets lighter and darker. Let me give you a better view of what that looks like. So the ND filter here on minimum, and then on maximum, ooh, that really paints a good picture. So if you use a variable ND filter, and it's not a coincidence that this is a 49 millimeter filter thread, you can give yourself longer exposures than you would just with available light. That's extremely useful if you want it to slow down motion, show some blur, get waterfall um, motion into your image and so forth. There we go. And this is extremely useful with the 50 millimeter lens. So taking the 37 and a half to 49 millimeter step ring, you can put this now on the 50 millimeter lens. With the, uh, the 30 and a half to 49, you've got it on the 18 and just by itself, it can go onto the 70 millimeter. So one ND filter, two step rings, and two auxiliary lenses gives you a huge amount of additional capability with this system that it doesn't have anywhere else. With the 24 millimeter, um, it's got a 25 and a half millimeter filter thread or 24 and a half millimeter, something like that. I haven't been able to find a step ring that converts this to 39 millimeter, I'm um, sorry, to 49 millimeter rather. So, because it would be kind of convenient to have the ND filter for use with this guy as well. So that is the Pentax Auto 110 and the system and some ways to increase its flexibility because it is a small system and some ways to make it do some things that it otherwise couldn't to give you a little bit of exposure control over your images. And, and I gotta say, um, I'm not a huge fan of 110 film. I think it's very wasteful because of the, the plastic cartridges, which I'm certain just get thrown away. And the images from it, just because of the negative size, aren't going to shake anyone's world. But this is a really fun system to use, and it's really light, and it, if it's great for hiking or flying or going someplace. If you're if you're doing something like going to a protest and you wanna have a small camera, you can pull out, take a quick picture without any worry about what your settings are and then hide it again so that no one sees you. This is a great camera to do that too. So the size on this camera is a huge, huge advantage. And the ease of use is a huge advantage. And it's a niche camera, but it has some very significant uses that can be very beneficial. So that is it, that is my video for this, the Pentax Auto 110 and the 110 system in general. If this video was helpful, please leave me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track and that I'm producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, please leave those below and I, if I have the ability to implement them, I'm happy to. A lot of the evolution of this video series and my other videos comes from your suggestions. If you have comments or questions, please leave those below. I check every day or two and I try to get back as quickly as I can. And one last thing, thank you very much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next video series.